What's up? Good morning, everybody. Hello. Welcome to Exodus. I want to welcome you guys here. Thank you for coming. Um, I appreciate your presence, and more importantly, we hope, though, that uh, what you experience when you're here with us today is oh, um, time and space for, for you, uh, for us together as a family to connect, uh, to connect with God, to understand a little bit more of who he is um, and our relationship with him and how that plays out in our lives. I have a couple of just quick announcements for us, uh, for the youth this Friday. Where are we going to be? All right, good. We are going to be at the beach, right? We're going to have our bonfire. Uh, adults, you are welcome to come if you want to hang out with us. Uh, but we are going to be at the beach, so make sure you go there and make sure you get picked up from there. Or else you're going to be at church with your parents, right? Or with somebody else's parents. So make sure you, uh, make sure you come to that. Also, um, we have a joint service coming up on August 26th. And part of that is, you know, last time, we had a, last time we had a joint service, we had a basketball tournament, which we, you know, narrowly, you know, missed out on the finals, but it's okay. Um, we might have a better shot this, uh, this one because there's another tournament that's going to happen. It's going to be a four-on-four -four volleyball tournament, a grass volleyball tournament. Uh, you can enter, as, you guys can make, um, you know, teams for yourselves, pair up. I will play with the youth uh, just to kind of even things out. So youth, if you guys want to play, there's some of you guys that want to play in that tournament, play with me. And uh, adults, make as many teams as you want. It'll be a good time. Um, and there will be some kind of prize. I haven't decided yet. I'm in charge. So be aware for that. Be looking forward to that. Uh, just before we get into today's message, um, why don't we just spend some time in prayer? Uh, a couple of items to be praying for are, um, we want to continue praying for Galen. Uh, and as we know that he you know, got diagnosed with lymphoma. Um, you know, a little while ago, a couple months ago, and so let's just continue to pray for his recovery. Um, and let's pray for Daniel. Uh, there's a scare, right, that, um, you know, his lymph nodes also started swelling, so let's just pray that those will, that those will kind of shrink down. Okay, and um, let's just lift up uh, just these two brothers in prayer, and also ourselves as we uh, come before God in his word today. Uh, let's pray. And Father God, Lord, we thank you for our time together here. We thank you that we can come before you, Lord, uh, not just here, but, you know, everywhere that we're at, Lord, in, in prayer, knowing that you love us, that you listen, Lord, and you hear. And so, God, we want to come before you as a family, Lord. We want to lift up a couple of brothers to you, Lord, that are, um, whose situations are just kind of up in the air, Lord. We want to pray for Galen, Lord, um, just as he is uh, just going through treatment right now for, uh, for his lymphoma. Um, Lord, we just pray, God, that you know, just that the chemotherapy would be effective, Lord, that you would um, help remove just the cancer cells, Lord, and make things right in his body. Father God, we pray for his wife, Michelle, Lord, as she cares for him. And we just pray, Lord, that you would um, just give her moments of peace and of rest, Lord, and, and also where she can just lay down her fears and worries to you, Lord, as well. That you take her burdens, Lord, take both of their burdens upon your own heart. Um, Lord, we also pray for our brother Daniel. God, and, and, um, and Lord, we just pray for just healing in him as well, Lord, for his uh, lymph nodes. We pray, Lord, that it is just a viral thing right now, God, and we ask, Lord, that you would just bring healing into his life as well. We lift him up into your hands. And God, we just give you this time of worship today, this time in your message, this time in your word, Lord. We ask that you would uh, call us to faith, that you would call us to listen, that you would call us to change, Lord. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Oh, I've got it. I got it. I can do this. <clears throat> I had a friend visit me last weekend <clears throat> in town after we had retreat. There's a friend I grew up with in high school, and, uh, and we're talking about movies and stuff, you know, and what she's watched and what she hasn't watched, and she's like, you know, I just can't do zombie movies, uh, right? I can't do zombie I know. I heard a sad... Right? I can't do zombie movies. They're too scary. I was like, why are they too scary? Like, how can that be different than a, you know, like a vampire movie or like, you know, other movies that we watch are pretty dark too, right? And gross and scary. You know, and she's like, well, because I kind of believe that zombies could actually happen, right? And I was like, what? So she's like, yeah, you know, I don't know if they would, I don't know if they would like, you know, shamble around and like eat human people, right? Eat human flesh. But I kind of believe. Right, or I have this, you know, I have a belief that, um, 
that if, like that it is possible to animate a dead body, right? It would probably be somehow possible within science at some point in time to like make a dead body like move around, right? And then I was thinking about it, I was like, you know, it's probably true, right? Like that's so creepy, you know? And, and I was like, and so that's why, and she was like, yeah, and she made a believer out of me, right? And I was like, oh, that's so gross, right? Like zombies could happen. You know, because if you think about it, right, if our muscles are just kind of like electrical impulses, someone could probably at some point figure out something, you know, like slap it on the back of a dead body and, you know, make it move around maybe, right? Is that gross? Like, I don't know, Crystal, do you think it's possible? Sorry, I don't mean to do this time. <laughs> right? But like, you know, it's, it's crazy to think. You know, it's crazy to think. And I don't know if you have ever been to um, an open casket funeral. Right, but uh, when you open, you know, when you see people's body, I mean, they look so real. I mean, well, they're real, right? <laughs> Sorry, you know, but right. I mean, I've been to places, and and I'm just thinking, I was like, any moment, this person's gonna open their eyes, right? Any moment, you know, I'm just like waiting for it. And that'd be so crazy, right? Like that'd be so crazy. That'd be freaky to me, and I can understand now why she doesn't watch zombie movies. Because right? I would freak out. I would really freak out like if something like that happened. And then now that I think like it's possible, maybe I'm not going to watch any zombie movies anymore for the rest of my life. Because right? it's creepy to think of a dead body like moving. Right? It shouldn't be moving. It shouldn't. There's just something wrong about that. Right? There's something wrong about that entire thought. Right? Even if it wasn't a body, if it was just like an animal, you know, or something like that. That's weird, right? And so. <clears throat> That's kind of a bad analogy, but, but the, the passage that we're talking about today, right, is about dead bodies living, okay? It is about what is something that is supposed to be alive, moving, you know, um, but it's really dead, you know, something that is dead that just kind of looks like it's alive, right? And specifically, it's talking about that in terms of our faith, right? Now, I... <clears throat> I'm taking a step of faith right now because apparently I printed out my sermon and um, I left it on the computer, so uh, on my printer. Yeah, so it's good times, but I have the passage with me and so we're going to go through this together. If you have your Bibles, you can open up to James chapter 2, verses 14. And the question that we want to ask ourselves today, right, is, is our faith alive? Is our faith alive? James 2, verses 14 to 25. It says this, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. If, you know, if Michael Hung shows up at your door in the middle of winter wearing a t-shirt and shorts, you know, he's cold, right, and he's like, you know, he's hungry, and you open up the door, and you're like, oh, sorry, man, I got people over right now, but I hope you get a meal, and I hope you find some place warm to sleep tonight, and he just shut the door in his face, right? Like, what good, you know, is that kind of sentiment, right? What good is that kind of sentiment, right? And so that's basically what, you know, that's what James is saying right here. You know, if one of you says to someone that has a brother or sister, someone in your family that has no food, no clothes, right, and if you just say well wishes to them but you don't offer them something, then basically it's meaningless. And he's saying the equivalent is the same between faith and actions. Okay, the equivalent is the same between our faith and our actions. Right, this is James saying it, right? Isn't that what he says? But someone will say, you have faith and I have deeds. Right? Maybe somebody else will be like, well, my gift is more on the faith side, and your gift is more on the deed side. Right? And James is like, no, 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 that doesn't work either, right? Because in, uh, in the rest of verse 18, he says this, Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that. And shudder. Right? He says, you, he's basically saying, you know, you can't, have faith without deeds, right? Because if your faith, if you just have faith, you have a trust, maybe an understanding in your mind that like, okay, I believe that God is real. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, right? I believe that he died. I believe that he rose again. And, you know, and 
I have eternal life in him, you know, or you believe all of these things. I believe that Jesus is God. Well, he's like, oh, that's good, right? That's the same faith, you know, that's the same knowledge, that's the same belief that demons have, basically. Like, at that place, you are at that same level, right? You have the same understanding that, you know, someone that is completely against God, right, a spiritual being that is completely against God also has. But I will show you my faith by my deeds, right? And the thing is that our deeds will share, will tell at some level, right, what our faith is in. Let's continue. He gives a counter-argument here. He says this, you foolish person. Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. Right? In the same way was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a, in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. James references two parts in the Old Testament that their readers would be familiar with and maybe you're familiar with also. The first one is Abraham. Right, Abraham was God's chosen, right? And he made a covenant with Abraham. He said, Abraham, I am going to bless you. I am going to bless you with, you know, with land, right, with descendants, you know, and I am going to bless the world through you, right? And he promised Abraham all of these things, right? And Abraham goes through all of his life without any of these really happening, right? He's like moving around. He is kind of gaining wealth, right? But he does not have any children, right? He doesn't have you know, the land yet, right? And so then God, finally, like after some periods of trial, right, he has a son, one son, right, of his own, his own son. And then God tells him, okay, you need to sacrifice your son. Right? And so Abraham is like, what? You know, right? And it says Abraham's faith was made complete by his action when he willingly offered then to be obedient to God in his sacrifice, right? The second, the second example that they use is Rahab the prostitute. And basically what had happened there was that um, this is the city of Jericho. Joshua is going into the city of Jericho. He sends in two spies. He says, okay, check out the city, right? Find out what you need to know and come back and report to me. These two spies, they go into the city. Um, and Rahab, right, who is this prostitute that's living in the city, recognizes them and recognizes that. And she's like, oh, I know you guys. You guys are from Israel. Right, you guys are from Israel. I know Israel. Israel is God's people. I have faith in that God, so I am going to protect you. <laughs> right, I am going to help you. So she hides the spies right into in her place, right, like in the roof. I think, you know, when the guards come over looking for them, and then she, you know, and and um, and then she tells them to go another way while the spies make their way home. Right, and Rahab and same same argument. Rahab's faith. Right, Rahab's faith is made real by her deeds. And the thing is, you know, in verse 18, he says, show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. And the thing is this, it's not actually about whether you have faith or not, right? But, but it is just that your deeds will show you what your faith is in. Your deeds will show you where you place your faith, Right? If you spend all your days, you know, like, you know, I don't know, playing video games, and there's a certain level of faith in these video games that you are exercising, right? Like, hey, I believe that these are going to be, like, my good time, right? This is going to be the best thing that, that there is for me. Right now, I have faith that this will be what I need, right? If you spend your time on your career, right, and, like, figuring out work and stressing over that, then you're like, well, I have a faith that somehow, at some level, right, me spending all my time doing this in my work, Right is, is going to give me something, yield some result, some favorable result in my life that I'm looking for. Right? All of our actions we do because we have a certain belief in them. Right? We have a belief in what we do will produce something in our lives. That is a faith. Right? That is a level of faith. And so if we simply just kind of look at the actions that we take throughout the day, right, we can take a look and we can take stock of this is what I put my faith in. 
You know, if I sit down and I think, okay, this is what I do throughout the day, this is where my faith is. Right? Our actions will necessarily point somehow back to our faith, what we place our faith in. And likewise, and so what, what James is saying here, he's specifically talking about a certain type of faith, right? He's talking about a faith in God. A faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior will also cause and bring out certain actions in your life, right? If you live in faith, right, then certain things just kind of happen out of that, right? Certain things will, will certain actions will come out. The problem is that, you know, we also oftentimes, like, we focus so much on the actions and not enough on the faith, right, that we end up just kind of doing stuff. Right? And I call that the fake it till you make it, right? Like we look like we're doing the things that say we have a lot of faith, right? But maybe inside our faith is weak, we're just doing certain actions. You know, maybe our faith is in looking good, or our faith is in having a good reputation, or our faith is in, you know, in actions versus in God. <coughs> the true fact is that if we sit down and we take a look at our lives and what we do, we can take a look at our faith. Right? And so the question is, is our faith alive? Right? What deeds do we do throughout our days that require, that ask us to place faith in God, that come out of a faith in who God is, what his plan is, you know, where he's at, right, and what he's calling us to do? How much of how much of what we choose to do in our lives comes from that faith? You know, we can easily just kind of take a, take a test. Right? You can just look. And that's what James is saying, is that you can look at your life. Right? What you do is what you believe. Right? If what you do is what you believe, then there, you know where your faith is at. So then the question is, like, is our faith alive? Do we need some spiritual CPR. There is this idea that, um, you know, in the Bible, that we are incomplete beings, right? That we are incomplete, you know, um, and we call it sanctification, right? And like there is this process that God is taking us through as people to, be, to draw us and have us become more like Christ, right? And there's a process for how this, you know, how love in our lives, how faith in our lives becomes complete. Right? And we as incomplete people, right, we have an incomplete faith. And here it says, you know, for Abraham, right, in verse 21, or verse 22, it says that you see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. Faith is completed in the choices that we make. Right? Faith is completed by what we do. This isn't the only place where it talks about this. You know, in 1 John 4, 12, right, he says this, right? And if you're a youth, you heard this on Friday night, right? We know that God is love, right? Um, and if you love one another, your, your love will be made complete, right? Our love is made complete also as it comes into our lives and it's move out. Christ's love in us is made complete, right, as we push it, as things push out of our lives. Right? As things come into our lives right, from Christ, you know, we get an understanding of who he is, fine, we believe in who he is, great. Right? But those are incomplete until they start moving out of our lives. Love is incomplete until it starts coming out of us right? and starts extended to, extending to our brothers and sisters. Faith is also incomplete until it starts moving out of us right, and starts showing up in what we do. How does this change, right? How would this change what we are meant to do, what we are supposed to do, right? What does this change? What does it mean then to live a life of faith? Right? Now, honestly, a lot of our deeds will probably be the same, but our motivations will just kind of change. Right? Don't pray before a meal because you know you should. Right? Pray because you really believe, wow, God provided this for me. You know, God has given this to me, right? Don't pray for people, you know, when they're, you know, when they're hurting because you, 
you know, you just know that that's the Christian thing to do, right? Pray because you know that God is actually sovereign over creation, right? In charge and, you know, and has the strength and ability and power to bring healing into our lives, right? Don't share the gospel because, like, you know, that's just something that we're supposed to do as Christians. But share the gospel because you actually believe that, wow, the best thing that I could ever give to a person is a relationship with Christ. Right? And once our faith extent, you know, once that faith, you know, starts you know, building in our lives, right, then our actions will show. If you really believe, if you truly believe that, wow, God is the best thing I could possibly ever, you know, introduce to someone, give to someone, offer to someone, right, your actions will show. If you truly believe, like, wow, you know, above all things, like, God is healer, redeemer, right, your actions will show. Right, if I, you know, if you really believe, you know, that, you know, like God's ways at giving up your life and denying yourself and, you know, making sacrifices for God's kingdom is actually better, then your actions will show. And I know you're thinking like, man, this is really hard. That's really difficult. You know, that's really hard to do. I, you know, I don't know if I could just believe you know, I, I don't know if I can just like read, read something in the Bible and be like, okay, I, I can trust that, I can believe in that. The thing is, I think we do this all the time, right, with other things. I'll read an article, I'll read a review on Yelp, and it'll say, man, this restaurant is awesome, right? Blah, 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 somebody I don't know, right? You know, and they'll say all these things about it, and I'll be like, oh yeah, I'm going to go to that restaurant, I'm going to go try it out, Right? I'll read, you know, like an article on like diet or something and be like this. I, I took nutrition class my freshman year of college or sophomore year of college. And because of it, I was so convinced. I drank 32 ounces of milk every single day because I was like, I need to get my 100% calcium. Right? I'm afraid because now I've read this. People have told me this, you know, that, man, my bone density is growing still until I'm 30. And then it's just a slow decline. So I better build it up now. Right? And the Asians are like number one, especially Asian women, sorry, right, are number one at risk for osteoporosis. So, man, it is important. So I was like preaching the gospel of milk to my friends. I was like, you know, you need to like drink some cal, you need to drink some milk, eat some broccoli, because broccoli ounce for ounce has as much calcium as milk does, right? Eat some broccoli, drink some milk, right? And get that calcium because you are at risk. All because in a book I read it or my teacher said it to me, right? I had faith. I believed them. And my actions showed. And we do this all the time. You know, I wasn't there. Like, I don't see this. I don't see the experiments. I don't see what they're doing. Right? I don't know the process of literary review for people's studies and whatnot. And yet I believe in all sorts of things. All sorts of things. Every single time. I just bought a uh, portable air conditioner for the house for when we have hot nights on Tuesday night for Exodus, so it'll be cooler on sharing nights this Tuesday, but, you know, and uh, before I did, though, I was like, oh, that's a lot of money, I better, I better read up on stuff, right? I better go check out, you know, like, what people say about it, I better, you know, read, read this review, I better see how many stars they give it, and I'll believe that stuff, right? I'll, maybe not just one, but I'll read a ton of it, and I'll be like, okay, you know, maybe after I read four people's, like, glowing reviews of you know, how awesome this thing is, right? Then I'll be like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. I can, I can see that. I'm going to give that a shot. Right? In the Gospels, we have four different people's point of views about, like, how awesome Jesus is, right? <laughs> you know? And we put faith in stuff all the time. We put faith into action all the time. And yet, for some reason, well, I don't know why, like, some reason is so hard when we... When you open up our Bible and all of a sudden it becomes like, man, why is it so much harder for here? I've got four glowing reviews, <laughs> personal testimonies of how awesome Jesus is. Right? I've got, you know, like, all of these, like, I've got a book, right, that spans over thousands of years that all says the same thing, right? Consistent, consistent message about who God is, what he is, where he is, you know, who he, what he does his plan in this world, a consistent message, right, convincing, you know, convincing arguments, but yet it's so much harder. 
is so much harder. Okay. And yet, in other there are areas of our lives we just we just let our faith go. We just, oh yeah, I'll trust in that. I'll believe in that. I'll do that. Right. So where is where is your faith? Is your faith alive? Right, specifically in Christ, specifically in who He is. Right, we do this all the time. And my plea, right, and God's plea is that don't let your faith die. He ends with this analogy, right, at the end of the passage, you know, <clears throat> in this, um, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. And an actionless faith leads to a dead faith. And I would say a dead faith leads to a dead spirit. Right? And then we have just, we're zombies. You know, spiritual zombies. And that's crazy, that's scary. And I want to challenge you guys, you know, I want to challenge us as a church, I want to challenge us, you know, individually in our lives, like, let's, let's think about, you know, what are faith steps that we can take, right, faith actions that we can do. You know, for me, like, it was like, you know, I asked for Monica's pen this morning, I was like, dang it, my, you know, like, I left the printer sheets at home, I need to write down, like, this entire outline, like, right now, you know, all it's in my head, and, like, think about what I'm going to say, you know, and then worship starts, and they're like, oh, man, but I should be worshiping right now, you know, not, like, you know, just, like, figuring stuff out, you know, and I was like, okay, well, I'm just going to engage, right, let's just engage with Christ, you know, and I have all these, like, worries that are in my mind, I'm like, oh, I'm going to be thirsty, is my bottle of water there, like, all these things, you know, that I'm thinking through, and I'm like, okay, you know, where can I exercise faith? Right, then maybe I don't need to have everything down on my paper that I know how it's going to turn out. Know exactly what I'm going to say. <coughs> well, we're going into um, a time of communion right now. And communion itself is an act an action of faith. It is a time where we remember the uh, Last Supper, where Jesus sat with his disciples and he made a declaration over his body and his blood. And he said this, he said, this is my body broken for you. I right, eat this and remember. And he poured out the wine or he had the wine in a cup and he said, this is my blood right? Poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Right? Drink and do this in remembrance of me. And by taking communion, it is our faith act of saying, yes, right? Like, Christ, I accept, I trust, I believe uh, that your body was broken for me. I believe that your blood was poured out for my forgiveness, for my sins, and it is an active way of living out our faith in that. It's an easy way. The way we do communion here is simple. Um, we're just going to open up the, uh, the elements over there on the table. Um, Ryan's going to play a little bit of music for us. Um, and you can just take it at your own time. You can take it, sit down for a while if you want to pray and reflect, or if you want to pray and reflect first and then come up, it's up to you. Um, at some point, Ryan will just transition into our closing song. Um, but we just encourage you, if you have made a decision, you know, a faith step in your life, right, that God, you know, that Jesus is Lord, then you are welcome to take communion. Um, and if not, then I just encourage you to, you know, to, to just sit down and relax for a little bit before we close our service. Let me pray before we enter into this time. Father God, Lord, um, maybe our faith is not so big that we can offer huge actions towards you, Lord. 
But God, you know, as much faith as we have, Lord, we want, we want to live it out. And Lord, we just want to place trust right now and place belief and, and faith in your personal testimony of what you did on that cross, Lord, and what you did with your body and your blood, Lord, that you were broken for us. Lord, that you poured out your blood for our forgiveness. God, and in some small ways, Lord, that we ask, Lord, that this would be an act of faith, an act of trust, an act of belief. Lord, by taking communion now, I pray, Lord, that as we understand that more, that we would understand what it means to live out faith and actions as well. Lord, would you bring to mind specific things, Lord, that you want us to do in faith, that you would ask us to trust in you just as we trust in all of these other things in this world, Lord. Let us place our most, most trust in you. And Lord, lead us, Lord, lead us to a faith, complete that faith in us, Lord, as we seek to live it out. I pray all this in Jesus.